Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Mayor Sadaf Jaffer, and I want to welcome you to this evening's program. Um, this is a part and co-sponsored by the One Montgomery Committee of Montgomery Township. And our work over the past couple of years um, has been about building connections throughout the community. And I think one really important part of that is knowing our history. It's something that I've been really interested in, but it's not something I could do myself. I'm not an expert on it. And one of the great people who I met last year was Arla, who's one of our panelists for tonight. And she did an excellent presentation last year for uh, Montgomery Mosaic and One Montgomery. And then this year, I was really privileged to connect with a group of student researchers from Princeton University who are really passionate about the ideas and the concepts of identity, belonging, history, um, and understood when I was talking to them about how important it is to know our history and our present to think about the future in different ways. And uh, they've been doing excellent research um, on the forgotten histories of our region and making sure that we highlight the diversity of voices. And so they are really the ones who put together tonight's program about the Native heritage and, con and contemporary communities uh, in this region. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Rachel. Hi, so welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Junho and my teammates, Alec, Rachel, and Grant, uh, we make up a team called Monty for Heritage, a design thinking team from Princeton University. We're so honored to be working with Mayor Jaffer and the One Montgomery Committee to host this discussion. And we hope that we can foster a conversation about the full and inclusive history of Montgomery Township. So just a bit of logistics, here's how the talk will proceed today. We'll hear first from Pastor John Norwood, a tribal leader of the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape people, and then Arla Patch, an indigenous rights activist. Afterwards, we will hold an interactive Q&A session for which you, the participants, can ask your questions with the Q&A button below. It's the icon with the two speech bubbles. Um, and if you're unable to see the Q&A button, please feel free to send us a chat using the chat button, which is the icon with one speech bubble below. So logistics aside, let's begin. Before we hear from our speakers, I wanna first ask the question, let's first think about our own country, our state and our, uh, and, our, and our township. How well do we know our local histories? Who are the people involved in making our towns what they are today? Are there any groups that we leave out, whether accidentally or intentionally, when discussing our local histories? And how have these people contributed to who we are today as a nation and as a township? To tell us more, we are excited to introduce the Reverend Dr. Chair Norwood, the Principal Trustees of the Tuamba Supreme Court of the Nanticoke Lanai Tuamba Nation, for which he has also served as a councilman for over 15 years. He is the co-chair of the Tax Force on Federal Announcement at the National Congress of American Indians and the General Secretary at the Allies of Colonial Our Tribes. Dr. Norman is the Senior Minister to the Nanticoke Lenape Tribal Christian Prayer Circuit Ministry and has served for over 28 years as the pastor of the Ultima Village Christian Church of Erin, New Jersey, a natural urban congregation. He has represented his tribe at the national and international level. He has written about a letter of tribal history, culture, religion, and current concerns. We are honored to have him speak with us today. Mabu Norman, the floor is yours. I do thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm going to share my screen and, uh, and 
we're going to move relatively swiftly through these uh, slides. We have a limited amount of time, and there's another presenter. We want to give everyone a chance to um, to also uh, ask questions. So my presentation <clears throat> is We Are Still Here, uh, presenting the indigenous people of Shayekbe. Shayekbe is actually the native name for New Jersey. Uh, it, it means by the water's edge and or by the edge of the water. And it, it refers to the fact that three sides of our state are, are uh, surrounded by water. Some of the terminologies that we use, I'm always asked about, uh, what do you like to be called? Uh, are we a group, community, tribe, or nation? Or do you want to be called an American Indian, Native American, Indigenous, or First Nations people? Do we use certain terms like uh, prehistoric, or do you prefer pre-contact? Um, and that varies from person to person, from community to community. Personally, uh, I like to be called a community, tribe, or nation in regard to referring to my people. I don't like to be called a group because groups uh, are like clubs, and we actually are a tribal government, but also a community because we are extended family. Uh, in regard to how we're referred to, American Indian, Native, Indigenous, or First Nations people, doesn't really matter to me. Um, the reason that American Indian stays uh, something that is used at the national level is because Indian is used in our treaties, and therefore it becomes important for us to continue to perpetuate that use because it's in many of the treaties and many of the laws that refer to our people. Uh, there are those that, that may be offended by that, but the best way is to ask, and the uh, preference often is simply to be for, referred to by the name of your tribe. So I'm Nanticoke Lenape. In regard to whether people use the term prehistorical pre-contact, uh, there is a preference for pre-contact. There's a feeling as though anything that's prehistoric is what happened before Europeans showed up, as though it, it, there was no history. Well, there was history long before Europeans showed up on this continent, and it's, it's kept within our traditions, within our stories, within our ceremonies, so we prefer the term pre-contact. Some of the things that we need to try to do in, uh, in healing uh, our relationship with uh, non-natives is correcting stereotypes and understanding that not all uh, indigenous cultures are the same. There is no one uh, uh, culture that's Native American. There are many cultures, but there are also common values and common practices and perspectives. Some of the practices include things like smudging, which is the use of natural elements like cedar sage and sweet grass and tobacco uh, that, to bless and to purify uh, and symbolizing prayers rising to the creator. It's a form of natural incense. The use of a prayer pipe is also something that is common among uh, indigenous people here in North America. It's often called a peace pipe because it was used when uh, peace treaties were cut, but actually it is a prayer pipe and it can be used communally in ceremony um, or it can be used by an individual. Sweat Lodge is a superheated sauna. Uh, it varies from tribe to tribe, the type of lodge that may be used, but it's typically something that uh, promotes uh, a focus on humbly spoken and sung prayers, and it tends to be communal in nature. Common other practices include drumming, and there are various types of drums from various parts of the country. Uh, the use of medicine bags that hold items of personal significance. The symbol of the eagle and eagle feathers are commonly held in high regard, although different tribes view it differently. The observance of the four directions is something that is uh, common in, in regard to many of our ceremonies. And honor gifts are tokens of esteem or respect. We have a heavy relationship with the land that goes back uh, deep in our traditions. We believe that the land belongs to the creator and was given to our people to care for and to use. And another thing that is common across North America is the reference to uh, the land as Turtle Island. There's the ancient tradition that the island is alive, resting upon the back of a great turtle. And uh, we strive to acknowledge the fact that all things and all living things have, have to be respected as important and sacred. The little fellow that you see on the slide here in the lower right-hand corner is a muskrat. And uh, part of one of our ancient stories is that indeed it was the muskrat that brought the earth, uh, the bit of dirt or earth up from the bottom of the sea. 
and the creator placed it on the back of a great turtle and it grew and became the land. Uh, this moral story teaches us to respect the land as living and also to respect that even small creatures are of great importance. We have a relationship with the creatures around us. We believe that all life is sacred, that it belongs to the creator. We're connected to the creatures around us. We don't overhunt them. Uh, we understand that if one has to be taken, we, we try to use every bit of it. Uh, traditional hunters will even pray and offer tobacco if they uh, are successful in the hunt, uh, thanking the creator for the, the animal that will help sustain their families and asking uh, forgiveness for having to take the life. The tribes that are uh, in the immediate region around New Jersey and in New Jersey are the Nanticoke and Lenape. The Lenape territory extends from southwestern Connecticut, southeastern New York, all of New Jersey, eastern Pennsylvania along the Delaware River, and down into northern Delaware to surround the Delaware Bay. In the southern part of uh, the territory are the Nanticoke and the Nanticoke's uh, homeland and territory was across the central Delmarva. They emerged in ancient times from the Lenape, and which is one of the reasons the Lenape are called the grandfathers or ancient ones, uh, because many of the tribes in the Northeast uh, view them as their ancestral tribe. In New Jersey, at one point, the state was divided into two colonies, West and East Jersey. And in, in West Jersey, in the southern part of the state, uh, there was a colony that predated uh, the arrival of William Penn called Fenwick's Colony. And between John Fenwick's Colony and the treaties that we made with William Penn, the relationship with the Quaker community in southern New Jersey was extremely strong. The famous Treaty of Shackamaxon, known as Penn Treaty, and the park is still in Philadelphia, where you can see where the treaty was cut. And the famous wampum belt, which is beads of shells that wove a pattern on a belt, is still preserved uh, in a museum in Philadelphia. Uh, it, it was a symbol of trying to live together. When William Penn, the governor of Pennsylvania, and our chief Tamanen, who was the representative spokesman for our chiefs, came together, they made promises to one another to strive to live in harmony with one another. Unfortunately, after Penn left, we find that that began to fall apart and most of the Lenape and Nanticoke people were pushed westward and northward out of the territory by the middle of the 1700s. We viewed the arrival of the European in, as an invasion and the early captures resulted in hostile receptions from some of the, the people that are known in American history, one of which was John Smith of Pocahontas fame, Nanticoke uh, uh, warriors actually tried to ward him off as he arrived up one of the rivers in our territory from the Jamestown colony. But he realized that he had to show a certain amount of respect and left gifts on the shore for us. And we began trading with them instead. Unfortunately, 90% of the population of our people was decimated by disease and war within the first hundred years. One of the Nanticoke chiefs is recorded as saying, for every one European that gets off of one of those boats, nine of our people die. The new immigrants who actually in many instances were only able to survive because of obligatory, the tradition of obligatory hospitality by our people, uh, as their colonies began to, to succeed, actually began to apply a belief that they had right to the land. And that was something that's based in a concept called the doctrine of discovery. It traces its roots back to papal bulls in the 13th century, and by the uh, latter part of the 1400s, we see that there is a grant that has been given by the Roman Catholic Church uh, to grant all Christian monarchs controls of the lands of infidels, which would mean any, any people that are not Christian. The specific wording included that they would capture, vanquish, and subdue the Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ to put them in perpetual slavery and to take all their possessions and property. This had resulted for uh, my ancestors into something that was rather horrific. Uh, our lands were beginning to be taken. Uh, 
those small reservation plots that we were allowed to stay on and Indian towns that we were allowed to stay in eventually wound up be becoming coveted by uh, the immigrant communities. And in most instances, we were even pushed off them. The small communities that remained clustered together uh, while so many others were pushed out of the territory. There was a point at which we were actually hunted for profit, which is one of the reasons that the term redskin is so offensive to us because it was a term that was commonly used to refer to our bloody scalps. Um, they were actually a way to uh, exchange a, a, the scalp of an Indian for money to prove that you had killed one of the Indians. In 1763, in the Maryland General Assembly, a scalp of one of my ancestors, no matter whether they were a man, woman, or child, was worth 50 pounds. And the only thing that needed to be stated was that they were an enemy enemy, enemy Indian, whatever that meant. It could mean just about anything. There was no distinction made between men and women, and it was interesting because an enemy was any Indian who didn't call loud within 300 paces of an Eng Englishman's cleared ground or was walking in the woods and came across an English person or was wearing ceremonial paint on their body and didn't voluntarily call out and lay down their weapons and make a sign of surrender, that was considered an enemy, whether they actually were attacking or not. Any, any American Indian who neglected to call out and make the sign of surrender was, uh, could be killed and a bounty received for their scalp. We see that the principle of uh, giving negative stereotype to American Indians, Native Americans, actually is, is uh, in, within the very wording of the Declaration of Independence. As it is read on July 4th, many people don't realize exactly or think about and reflect on what they're saying. There's a portion and it refers to the merciless Indian savages whose rule, whose known rule of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Actually, this was something that was not true. Uh, traditional Indian combat typically was skirmishes and only between warriors. Um, and usually, after it, the, the, they did not result in any heavy casualties whatsoever. The concept of total war was something that was brought to us by Europeans. In addition to the fact that there were American Indians that were in support of the United States government as they were fighting for independence and others that remained neutral. The earliest reservations actually were here in the East and a lot of people don't know that. Uh, they, when you think of Amer American Indian reservations, there's a tendency to think of them all in the West, uh, in the Plains uh, states, but that's not the case. The earliest ones were, were formed in the 1600s and they were in the East and uh, within New Jersey and Delaware and Maryland there were reservations during the colonial era. Uh, they were disbanded in, in, in our region, although there were some in Virginia and some up in uh, New York State and Massachusetts that continued after the colonial era. But we were, we were uh, pressured to live on the, either live on the reservations uh, uh, or leave. And many were forced to migrate or the, and those who stayed had to adopt to Anglo-American ways in order to survive. Those who remained, sadly, were often reclassified as persons of color, free persons of color or mulatto instead of Indian. And the reason is because according to laws of the day, the definition of an Indian was a non-Christian living in the woods and eating primarily deer meat. So if one of my ancestors uh, became a Christian, was baptized and lived in a European style house and ate chicken, um, they were no longer considered Indian. They were a free person of color or a mulatto. Uh, I have ancestors whose actual census records were changed from Indian to free person of color or mulatto based upon when they were baptized as a Christian. Uh, the definition was later augmented for those living far away from the state uh, of Delaware, which is an indication that they just simply were declaring their state free of our people. As time went on, there was a move to eradicate the culture from the 1880s to the 1960s, Indian children were forcibly taken from their families and placed in boarding schools uh, and to assimilate them and destroy their very culture. Uh, what you see in the left upper picture are the tombs of children uh, that were uh, 
that died at the Carlisle Indian Institute. Uh, sadly, today, there are many who don't even know it's there. Um, Carlisle is a military academy now. It, it, it is the war college. And there are people that even live in the town that don't realize the history of the place. The handcuffs that you see are in the upper right picture are actually for children. Those are handcuffs that were used at the Haskell Indian Institute, a school that some of my own relatives went to. According to the 2010 census, you may be surprised to know that most American Indians do not live on reservations and that there are Indian tribes still here in New Jersey. 78% of those identifying as American Indian live, don't live on reservations. There are state recognized tribes and an, and an acknowledged community right in our, in our area. Uh, in the north, we have the Ramapo Lenape. Central is Powhatan Lenape. And in the southern part of the state, my own tribe, the Nanako Glen and Lenape. The Nanako Glen and Lenape are closely related to, uh, intermarried with, and it's the same families repeating themselves in the two tribes in Delaware, the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware and the Nanako Indian tribe in Delaware. The Sand Hill Indians are a small community of Cherokee and Lenape people that are acknowledged by the other state recognized tribes. The original people of the Delaware Bay are the Nanako Lenape people. And our government continued for uh, over 150 years um, as, uh, as part of the churches that were established in the early 1800s by our people and our documented historic Indian churches to this very day. Uh, there are two in Delaware, there is one in southern New Jersey. The community continued to take care of itself even though we were the remnants that, were, that stayed behind as so many were pushed out of the state. And in the 1800s, not only did we organize churches, but out of the churches, schools were organized also, and eventually a reorganization of the tribal government out of the church with constitutionally ele elected council and chief. Our culture is alive, we're still here. We, we uh, continue to practice our culture. We join in with other tribal communities across the country in celebrating a living culture that is not stuck in the past, but continues to evolve. Our elders and our youth are looked to for wisdom and guidance from the past and for the strength of our future. One thing that a lot of people don't know is that for over three centuries, the Nanako Glenape have maintained a very close relationship with the nation of Sweden. And when the king and queen depicted here in this picture, along with the crown princess, come to Delaware or Southern New Jersey to visit with the Swedish community there, because that region was called New Sweden prior to the English colonies being established, uh, they also uh, have audience with our chiefs in a continuing relationship that goes all the way back to the 1600s. Some of the stereotypes that need to be corrected, uh, our people never lived in teepees. We were not teepee people. We, we did not use um, bark canoes, but dugout canoes in this region. Uh, never were savages. We had our own civilization, different from European society, but civilized nonetheless. We were not nomadic. We had summer and winter villages that we went between based upon the weather. We were the ones that granted occupancy to the Swedes, the Dutch, and eventually the English, placed on some of the first reservations in the history of the United States. The other thing that people don't understand is that we're not historic reenactors. When we put on our regalia, we're displaying who we are by heritage. Some of the stereotypes that we try to overcome is the fact that a lot of people assume that all American Indians somehow get government checks. And I've always wondered how that happens because I've never gotten one. Um, and usually uh, what some tribes receive is funding based upon treaty rights from the federal government. And then the tribe may distribute funds either from, from those annual allotments or because of the businesses that the tribe may have itself. But just simply getting a check because you're an American Indian is something that doesn't happen. Um, we live in houses, we have jobs, and we are citizens of both the United States and our tribes. And not all American Indians or tribes want or even have casinos. Our tribe actually has a law against profiting from any form of vice. Our traditional dress is called regalia because it's an expression of who we actually are. It's not a costume, which 
is when you're making believe that you're something you're not. And our culture is not stuck in the past. A question that comes up is what is an American Indian tribe? Because there are many who get confused today. And it's extremely important for people to understand that a tribe is, a, is, a, is a, an interrelated uh, community of historic families that, are, that have lived together in community and maintain tribal governance for at least a couple of hundred years. Uh, it's historic, continuous, interrelated, and self-governing. There's nothing, no such thing as a new tribe. Uh, there may be uh, communities that become recognized, newly recognized by the state or federal government, but they have to be ancient in origin. They need to go back at least to the 18 or 1700s. Any, any group that suddenly coalesces because they've discovered that they're American Indian, that could be a heritage society, that could you know, sell or a cultural enthusiast group, but a tribe has been such for a long, long time. Some of the points of frustration are those self-proclaimed experts that disregard our own stories and the definition of our communities, the misappropriation of our culture and rituals, the way that we're handled by the federal government and the sports mascots that we find insulting and demeaning to our people, even when we're told they're meant to honor us. There's a difference between being indigenous and non-indigenous. If you're non-indigenous, uh, your culture exists in a foreign land and continues even if your group here wants to become part of the melting pot. Our culture only exists here. The suppression of the culture means total cultural extinction, annihilation from the face of the earth. Your self-identification is accepted because you say you are who you who, who you believe you to, your, yourself to be, who you say your ancestors are, if you're not uh, indigenous. But if you are indigenous, you're an American Indian, you have to prove that you are and that you're acknowledged uh, by non-native authorities as such. As a non-indigenous group, you have a choice to be part of the melting pot with the exception of the victims of American slavery. Whereas American Indians, our culture, there will be total cultural destruction uh, it was, and it was actually part of American policy for 200 years. American Indians cannot label their arts and crafts as American Indian made if their tribes are not recognized by a state or federal government. And not all tribes are. There are many unrecognized tribes that are historic. In order to have certain rights, your tribe has to have certain recognition from the state or federal government. And that allows you to identify yourself in, as an American Indian for the benefits that others might be able to get just simple, simply through self-identification. For more information, I invite you to check out um, these websites. I understand this presentation will be posted by Montgomery Township, and so you'll be able to grab these even though I'm going to be passing the ball to my fellow presenters. I thank you for your attention and I thank the hosts for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Reverend Norwood, for that powerful and extremely important sharing. It definitely leaves us with a lot of food for thought. Ala Patch is an artist, writer, and certified Pennsylvania teacher. Raised in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, she lived in Maine for 30 years and became involved in the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission as Community Engagement Coordinator. This Truth Commission investigated what happened to Native children in the child welfare system. Partnering with the Kids Bridge Tolerance Center, Arla is the recipient of two grants from the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. They developed educational programming on Indigenous concerns, where she collaborated with Pastor Norwood and other New Jersey tribal leaders. Arla is a founding member of the Coalition of Natives and Allies, is a member of the Doylestown Friends Meeting, and is also a grandmother. We are so excited to hear what she has to say. Take it away, Arla. Hmm, let's see. You're unmuted now. Yeah, I'm just not sure why um, the PowerPoint isn't up. Now, here we go. Did that work? 
Yes. Okay, great. Sorry for the tech slowness. <laughs> Well, first, I humbly. One second, Arla, you might want to go full screen on that that one window, because right now we're seeing your whole. Uh... Oh dear. Okay. Um, I thought I was. Let's see. Um, hmm. Don't understand why it's not the full screen. Um, I think on that screen itself, like you can see the three bubbles at the top. Yeah, uh, on the top left. Uh, no, of the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, uh, the third one. Try. Oh, how do I go back to the beginning? Oh, dear. Sorry, folks, for this tech <laughs> numbness here. Um, I stopped the share. If you want to reshare and then select just that window, you should have the opportunity when you say click share screen to just click that presentation. Okay, so I click share screen again and then I click on the PowerPoint. Yes, there we go. And is it full screen? It's perfect. Okay, great. Oh my goodness. Oh, first I do want to humbly acknowledge that uh, we are on Lenape tribal territory, Lenape Hoking. And this is Chief Mark Gould, as you saw in some of Pastor's uh, images. He is the current chief of the Nanticoke and Lenape Nation. I'd like to thank Dr. Norwood for the honor to present with him, and also to the brilliant students of this Monty for Heritage and also Mayor Jaffer for this opportunity for me to speak as a Euro-American occupying unceded indigenous land. Nearly all of us non-natives were not taught the basic truths of our shared history. You did hear a lot from um, Pastor Norwood that I am also going to cover, so maybe hearing it a second time around um, might be actually helpful. The ignorance of these facts has created so much suffering and damage. The lack of awareness maintains the original colonialism in our country right up to present day, and we need to decolonize. I'm going to cover a lot of territory in this short presentation, so I wanted you not to be distracted by having to take notes. So I have a fact sheet that is included either in the sidebar or also going to be uh, sent to you as a follow-up. And for the sake of time, some of the items I'm just going to refer to that are on the uh, information sheet, um, because I do also want you to have those facts so that you can share the information that you get tonight with others. This is a great ally action step. So people will say my family um, came recently and I don't have anything to do with this history. But the fact is that anyone who is occupying this territory right now, whether it's for 200 years or 200 days, you are benefiting from the fact that native people have been targeted for destruction. Let me explain. First, I'd like you to imagine young children that you know, maybe your own, your own children, your own grandchildren, your neighbors, being taken by the government, by law, to a boarding school very far from your home. And they were taken as young as the age of four. They'd be forbidden to speak the only language they knew, their hair cut off, doused with DDT powder, which is a carcinogenic insecticide that's been outlawed and their mouths washed out with lie if they spoke their own language. Siblings would be separated from each other intentionally and kept apart. They'd be given foreign sounding names, put in uniforms, and held to a rigid military school regiment with no parental love. They'd be forced to practice a religion that told them that they had sinned and were savages. As Pastor mentioned, the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania was the flagship school, and it was the model for these Indian residential schools all over the US and Canada. In addition to the emotional abuse, there was a good chance that they would suffer physical and sexual abuse. And also possible that they would not come home in the summer, hired out to work in local farms. And it's also possible that they would not even return to their community until they were 18, not knowing their language, understanding their culture, or being bonded with their parents or any parental figure. 
they would not have experienced loving parents and loving community. I'm sure you can imagine how devastating this would be for the children taken, but also how it would break the hearts of the parents and communities left behind when nearly all the children had been taken generation after generation. This is what happened to many generations of Native peoples in this country. And the peak of the boarding school era was in the 1970s in the US, the last residential school in Canada closed in 1996. And in the 50s, this practice morphed into policies of adoption and foster care, creating the same results. Parents losing their children and children losing their parents. This practice of high levels of adoption and foster care continued today. In South Dakota, for example, Native children make up 13.5% of the population, but they make up 54% of the foster care population. The taking of Native children is just one of many violations to Indigenous people in this territory that we call the United States. It has left Native communities with the highest rate of socioeconomic distress in this country by far. There is a shameful history that we were not taught, a history of consistent policies and laws and actions to decimate Native people since first contact 500 years ago. And as Dr. Norwood pointed out, there is a powerful underlying cause. 40 years before Columbus even sailed, popes in Rome were putting out their declarations collectively known as the doctrines of Christian discovery. They essentially declared that if you land in a foreign territory and the inhabitants aren't Christians, they are enemies of Christ. And you can, as Pastor showed you, all of these various aspects of the direct doctrine. Essentially, their value, the people that you found on these lands, were really no more than the wildlife that exists there. This is an early example of white privilege. And you'd think that this, these doctrines of discovery were part of 15th century history, but the doctrine of discovery had been cited in many federal cases up through right, into, right up to 2005. And this is when the Supreme Court had ruled in Sherrill versus the United Nation against the Oneida. And I'm sorry to say that Ruth Bader Ginsburg delivered the opinion to the court. Christopher Columbus never even reached what is now known as the United States. And he and his men committed horrific atrocities documented in the diaries of a monk who witnessed them, Bartholomew de la Casas. Reading the, those accounts helps us understand why celebrating Columbus with a holiday and statuary is unacceptable. Working to change that day into Indigenous Peoples Day in your community or university is another way to decolonize. And congratulations to the town of Princeton who declared Indigenous Peoples Day in October 2019. Pastor Norwood also told you about the bounties, another target of destruction. And it's one of the practices, as he mentioned in particular, that makes the use of sports teams named Redskins so especially egregious. The bounties existed all over this country, and they placed a generous payoff on that bloody scalp of an Indian. And as he mentioned, there was also an amount for children under the age of 12 in this Spencer Phipps proclamation. Men bought the highest amount, a year's salary for clergy at the time, but you had to include genitals in that case for proof of gender. There's on your fact sheet, there are some very important statistics on the uh, bounties that I'd like you to take a look at. So indigenous people in this, in this country were the most legislated against of any group. And on the fact sheet, there are several that just I've sec sectioned out, um, just a few. There were multiple trails of tears. And the one thing I just want to mention on this Dawes Act, it comes straight from the mouth of the President Theodore Roosevelt. He said the Dawes Act is a mighty pulverizing engine to break up and destroy the tribal mass. And in 1882, our government outlawed Native American spiritual practices. And wasn't this country founded on religious freedom? 
Native people were not considered citizens until 1924. And did you know that Native people were not given the right to vote until 1954? And not in every state until 1962. This is particularly outrageous when you consider that Native people served in disproportionately high numbers in every military conflict since the beginning of this country, even helping win World War I and World War II with the code talkers. So they died serving a country that denied them the right to vote. These disturbing truths, especially for Euro-Americans like me, can bring up intense feelings of grief and guilt and shame. And these feelings can be metabolized by being turned into fuel. And that fuel can create personal change and community actions. But those actions need to be under Native leadership. The Dakota 38 was the largest mass execution in our country's history ordered by Abraham Lincoln. The evidence against the Dakota was very spare the tribunal was biased, and the defendants were unrepresented, many not even speaking English. I empower each of you to become teachers and share what you've learned tonight. That would be an important action of being an ally. And the term ally is not a noun, but it's a verb. Other actions that you can take to continue on your own is to learn this history and see your role in it. Our coalition has a website that has a great section on education. Performative allyship is when you say the right things, you post the right links, and you carry the right signs. True allyship is not what makes you look good, but it's taking a deeper dive into how you might perpetrate colonial attitudes and behaviors. Uh, I wanted you to note also that there is a section on the information sheet called What Do Allies Do? As a nation, we are definitely out of integrity with who we say we are and what we stand for with this, hunt, with this history going unnamed. By not acknowledging this past and working toward healing it, we are showing our children and the rest of the world a level of hypocrisy that is impossible to justify. For over 200 years, the federal government policies were based on the assumption that the annihilation or the assimilation of the tribes would be the best solution to quote the Indian problem. And then in 1948, the UN defined genocide as acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. You can see from this list how it is manifested. I'll just take one, which would be Article 2, Section A, the killing of members of the, of the group. I have a small sampling of massacres, but locally I wanted to mention one called the Naden Hutton Massacre because that was in Pennsylvania in, in 1782 of Christian Lenape. 96 were bludgeoned to death and they were mostly women and children. We must recognize that our government engaged in each of the articles in this definition of genocide and great harm has come from not acknowledging that truth. From the UN definition of genocide, Article 2, Section E, which was the forcible transferring of children from one group to another, this led to the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the United States in the state of Maine for what happened to Native children in the child welfare system. The Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission, on which I had the honor to serve. One of their findings in 2015 was that Wabanaki children are still being taken at a rate five times greater than non-Native children. The legacy of genocide has left the Native communities with the highest rates of socioeconomic distress, as I mentioned earlier. In every single measure, their statistics are not a reflection of who they are, but of what has happened to them. What you see in this image is what I was taught in fifth grade, manifest destiny, which is another way of wording the doctrine of discovery. What it said is that it was white people's God-given right to conquer these lands. And this is the conquer mentality. When I use the word we in this case, I'm referring to white people. We took their land. We took their resources. 
we took their lives. We took their children. And with the native sports mascots today, we're taking their identity and they're telling them that we are honoring them. It was okay for these kids to pretend to be Indians above when it was not okay for these kids to actually be Indians in the image below. I'm a founding member of the Coalition of Natives and Allies, and we're a cross-cultural collaborative acting as a resource to support ending racism and cultivating respect. Our website is on the information sheet, and you can join our email list there. We have developed as a group a six-step guide for schools to actually honor Native Americans. And in, um, for the sake of time, I, I'm not going to go through this, but I want you to know that that's one of the things that you can download. And I really encourage you to share that with the schools in your area. There are many, many issues confronting Native communities today, including continuing loss of tribal lands, pollution, oil pipelines, health services, voting rights, water rights and safety, missing, murdered, and indigenous women, and more. This one that you see in this image is an example of the state of Maine now telling the Penobscot tribal nation, whose reservation is a series of islands in the Penobscot River, that their river is no longer part of their reservation. Colonization is an ongoing process, not something that ended in 1776, with a 98% depletion of native populations since first contact through disease, war, and policies directly intended to reduce numbers with continuing to take their resources and children, break treaties and ignore sovereignty. We have a lot of repair to do. While white people can step in and out of activism if they choose, people of color can't. White privilege has prevented change, but now that privilege can be leveraged to, in the service of repair. With the death of George Floyd, coupled with the pandemic, it's created a change in the defenses that were once in place. Coalitions like the one that I'm in are working together, facing hard truths, listening to new ways, and creating a common understanding of a shared history. Healing and building community requires that common understanding of shared history. We have inherited this history together. If we don't acknowledge it, we keep it in place. Unless you are native, we all come from other lands. Most have lost our ancestral tribal territories and communities. From the privilege to occupy this land, for that privilege, it is our obligation to work on decolonization. We need a marriage of the head and the heart. This is my friend Esther, who's Passamaquoddy. We're still here and we have friends. In spite of all this history that I've shared with you, the resilience of indigenous peoples of this land is strong. Among native peoples, there is a movement of reclaiming their languages, ceremonies, traditions, food sovereignty, identity, and healing from the residential schools. Working together, we can work toward healing this history that we've both inherited and in a partnership and write a different ending. Thank you so much, Arla, for your moving words and presentation. We really, really appreciate it and very much needed it. With that, we would love to hear from everyone with any questions. So please type any questions you may have for our presenters in the Q&A section below. And thank you already for, for uh, Susan and Jeffrey for, for putting your questions below. Uh, as a reminder, to ask a question, please press the Q&A button, which is the icon with the two speech bubbles. So Pastor Norwood, if you could uh, <laughs> come back virtually to the screen and uh, we'll start the, the Q&A session. So actually I've, I've been blocked by the host. Uh, the host has to open my, allow me to open my video. It should work now. Okay, okay great. So the first question is uh, by Susan. Can the speakers comment on and pro provide some context for the so-called Jackson Whites that have been living in the R Ramapo Mountains of New Jersey for many generations? I can speak to that. And the, the, com the, the, the um, term Jackson White is viewed by the tribal people up there as quite insulting. Um, 
that's a, that's a term that was placed upon them and not one that they uh, embraced themselves. The Ramapo Lenape people are up in the mountains of Mawa. They cross over into the state of New York also. Um, there are about 4,000 enrolled members of the Ramapo Lenape Nation. They are a state recognized tribe of uh, Lenape people and uh, primarily Muncie Lenape, uh, which was one of the northernmost sub tribes. Um, they're, they're, uh, they've maintained their government. Uh, they have a historic uh, tribal church. I'm not sure which state it's in because they're on both sides of the line. Um, and uh, they have documented their history. Um, sadly, they've been maligned by certain historians, uh, which is not an uncommon tale for many tribes up and down the East Coast. But they are the Ramapo Lenape, and you can learn about them by looking them up online. Much. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeffrey uh, posted something as a question. Um, and for the sake of time, I won't read it in full, but it's really enlightening and, help and helpful and very complimentary to this presentation. So please take a look at, at Jeffrey's comment if you have the time. Um, one anonymous attendee said, are there any movements to expand the land area of different reservations? Uh, there are various tribes acquire land or have lands uh, that are placed into trust with the federal government. Uh, most tribes are trying to expand their land base in one way or another. Uh, we have a tribal land base down in Cumberland County. Um, and, real, and actually just a month ago, the United Methodist Church, in acknowledgement of our uh, historic tribal church there that goes back to the early 1800s, uh, pledged a million dollar endowment to, for its upkeep and protection. And also any churches that are closed within the tribal area down there, the land will go back to the tribe. Uh, so there's even cooperation on behalf of that is their fulfillment of their promise of reconciliation with our people. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you guys so much for the questions. Uh, I, I'm not sure we'll have time to answer all of them, but. We're very grateful that there's so much great engagement. Um, one question that Yuri asked, as well as Diane's question is quite similar. I think, Reverend Norway, could you talk about how close the language is between the Ramapo and the Nanjakup Leni Lenape? And also, could you talk uh, briefly about the Lenape language and its status as an endangered language? Uh, well, first, it, the thing about the Lenape language is it's the root language for all Algonquian speaking people. We call it Algic. Um, and it's, it actually is the root language, the most ancient um, language of that grouping is Lenape, uh, and which is part of the reason that uh, Lenape are called the grandfathers of the ancient ones because they are the tribe from which so many uh, came out of. The relationship between the, the language spoken by the Nanticoke Lenape and the, that spoken by the Ramapo is a dialect difference. The Ramapo spoke the uh, Muncie dialect, which is being um, uh, reaffirmed, recaptured uh, 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 in their community. Likewise, our community spoke uh, two, a, a, a Lenape dialect called Unami, Southern Unami specifically, and then the Nanticoke portion of our family spoke Nanticoke, which is an offshoot of Lenape. And, and we are trying to, to reaffirm and recapture that language, uh, the younger generation is much better at it than, than the older ones because there was so many years that we weren't allowed to speak it and could be punished for it. Along that same line, I think one, one question uh, that Lynn asked was, what can we do as allies uh, to improve K through 12 student education to teach accurate Native American history in New Jersey specifically? I'm going to give a brief answer and then let Arla pick that one up too because she's in the process of doing it. But one thing is to make sure that the books are accurate, that they reflect the fact that uh, the Lenape people uh, did, did not disappear from the face of the earth. They, were, they did not go happily but were pushed westward and northward and live in communities outside of the state and remain in communities in the state. Uh, there also needs to be a push to understand that our history didn't stop in the 1700s, but has continued and 
so has our culture evolved. So I guess what I would just add to that is that um, my partner, Lynn uh, Arsachi from the Kidsbridge Tolerance Center, we were the ones that partnered together to get those grants from New Jersey Council for the Humanities, and we began training teachers. Um, it's a slow and long process, but um, we did several of those. That's something that's um, really important is to get through to the teachers. But as parents with children in school, you can also speak up just to go to your school and ask questions, just to find out what books they are using. What are they doing with the, the typical misinformation of Thanksgiving? Um, are they allowing children to uh, appropriate indigenous culture in, through Halloween costumes? Are they you know, how, especially the mascot issue. I mean, the mascot issue is one very extreme example of an absolutely over the top appropriation with the way kids dress up at games, the um, tomahawk chop, the dances, the, I mean, it's, it's, it's unconscionable. And um, I'm working really hard on trying to change that as well. Um, I did see one comment here and ask um, for my definition of what I meant by decolonize. All you have to do is think about what the colonies did, the colonizers did, which was assuming that they were superior, um, not understanding the culture at all, um, not understanding even um, matriarchy and making assumptions of indigenous people and all the ways in which basically racism for all people of color is still embedded so deeply in our consciousness. And this, the best thing that help, has helped me is to just continue to study about my own racist attitudes and my own white supremacy attitudes. And um, every time I take one of those colonized attitudes and, and patterns and I, I reduce it, I reverse it, I'm decolonizing. There was a long question up above and I just wondered if, um, Junho, how do we, uh, if some of these questions really deserve to be answered and I'm just wondering what's the format that they could um, possibly get their answers? Um, because of, of course we don't have enough time here. Um, I mean, you could go to the, uh, especially the questions that are for the um, decolonizing kind of point of view, going to the website um, and then asking questions there because we'll follow up. Yeah, totally. So we're gonna send a follow-up Google form in which more questions can be asked and then we can direct those to you as well. Um, I wanted to just take one more question. I know this, this one has been here for quite a long time. So I wanted to take just one last question for you guys. Thank you everyone for your engagement and asking questions. We will be sending a follow-up um, Google form uh, just to, for every, any other questions that you might have. But this one I think uh, is, is quite important too. So uh, in the face of all the wrongs that have been committed against Native Americans, how are quote unquote Americans meant to approach the messy feelings this panel has spoken about like guilt and blame? At one point when listening to this panel, I almost said, I'm sorry. I then realized that my family only immigrated to the United States 40 years ago at the most. So my lineage did not historically commit those wrongs. How should quote unquote Americans, including those of recent immigrant background, approach feelings of guilt? Are those feelings necessary or constructive in the act of being an ally? I, I, it's never my goal to, to just make people feel guilty. And, and uh, I, I would rather simply inform and have people have a sense of conviction that, right, that wrongs can be righted in, in, for today by being informed, by having a certain uh, compassion for the plight and the perspective of indigenous people, uh, by learning who is remaining in your area uh, that that is connected to an indigenous community, perhaps engaging with that indig indigenous community. Most tribal communities have public events that you can visit and get involved in. Most native people are very friendly and wanna share and tell their story. Um, acting as a good neighbor, acting as a fellow citizen uh, and, and, and affirming that story. And when there is a cry for help against injustice coming alongside, those are the ways you can help. And I guess I would say as a white Euro-American that um, just being here and enjoying this land, you are in some way already, ha um, you're at an advantage. Somebody is paying a price for the fact that all this land has been taken. Um, guilt and, and shame um, are only useful if they become fuel 
for transformation for yourself. And I think it's important to have strong reactions because that's what opens up the heart. Uh, part of the problem in this country is everything's been too mental. And I think we really need to deepen it and feel it. And that can really motivate real personal change. And just the um, capacity to look at everything you do and just have that bank camera to see, um, am I part of the racist white supremacist actions or am I thinking and looking at things in a new way? Um, so it's, it's kind of a mixed bag, but um, I think it's important to have those feelings and those emotional reactions, but not stay buried in them for sure. And certainly don't give them to indigenous people because they don't need them. It's our work to do. Thank you so much, Reverend Norwood and Arla for your insights. I think we are just past the eight o'clock mark and we'll be wrapping up the panel now. To the audience, thank you so much for your questions. They have all been amazing and we really appreciate your enthusiasm and interest. As mentioned earlier, we'll be sending out a Google form for any remaining questions that you will still have. Obviously, tonight has started a lot of conversations, even some difficult ones. We hope that we can all move forward in a positive fashion and continue to keep these important topics in mind. Thank you so much for your questions again and participation in this panel. Our contact information can also be found on the Montgomery Township website and our Facebook event page. Our email is also in the chat below. We would like to thank the Montgomery Township and the Princeton University Keller Center and Tiger Challenge for allowing us to make this panel possible. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us for this evening. I wanna thank the pan panelists. It was really an honor to, to meet Dr. Norwood uh, virtually and, and learn from him and uh, continue this conversation. I know that uh, you know we, we have the scheduled time until 8 p.m. So I do wanna let the panelists go if they need to head out and as well as those who are participants. But I do wanna address a few of the questions. So if people need to leave, that's fine. But I know that there were some questions addressed towards the township. And so I wanted to just uh, talk, speak to those. So if you need to leave, I understand, but I do wanna just talk, respond to some of the questions that were posed towards the township. Um, one of them was about, you know, can we change that, that, uh, you know, we were settled at a certain date, that the township was settled at a certain date on the signs. Um, and I think that that's a really good point. Um, is there a consideration for changing the signs that State Montgomery was settled in 1793 or so, when clearly Native peoples have settled here prior to that? I mean, I would have to look at, at those signs. I think certainly uh, that's not accurate or, you know, what is it that we can say in terms of the history of the township? It is something that we need to think about. Um, and there was another, uh, you know, another thing that I wanted to mention is that we have a new municipal building that's coming up. And, you know, that was part of the impetus for me connecting with this Princeton uh, research group is to think about how do we create that space that is inclusive and that acknowledges all the history. Um, and so one of the things that I've been thinking about and, and talking to others about is having a land acknowledgement or, you know, making that a really durable part of that new building so that anybody who goes there understands that history. So, you know, that's something that I want to work with others on. Um, and it's, it is, you know, very, very important to me. And uh, I think for the, the, you know, the rest of the q and I will, I will try to share uh, with the school districts, the local school districts as much as I can. Um, but it's really been an honor. I think we need to do a follow up probably <laughs> next year or another time because there's so many questions. Um, but thank you again, everyone who joined us. And this video will be available as a resource for the school districts. And uh, we will hopefully keep this conversation going and keep the knowledge uh, and, and make it so that we, this isn't forgotten history anymore, it, or it's not a forgotten present uh, reality anymore. And I think that was a really important part of, of Dr. Norwood's presentation, that it's not just about history, it's about the contemporary communities as well. So thank you everyone and uh, have a good evening and thank you for joining us. And thank you, especially to our presenters. Such an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you, it was an honor to be part of it. Thank you.